Section 43 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 22 Administrative Reform and Foreign Affairs The Climax of the Century on the Continent, 1868 to 1874. Part 1 The disestablishment and disendowment of the Irish Church the reform of irish land tenure the establishment of a national system of elementary education these things large and difficult as they were did not exhaust the tireless energies of mr gladstone's first administration the army and the civil service the judicial bench and the licensed victuallers trade unionists and miners were some of the people who came within the orbit of their reforming activities down to the middle of the nineteenth century the principle prevailed that the public services existed in large measure in order to provide appropriate occupation for the cadets of the ruling families qualifying examinations for candidates were instituted in eighteen fifty five and a year earlier the places in the civil service of india were thrown open to competition the same principle was applied with few exceptions to the home civil service by an order in council in eighteen seventy a very few of the highest posts may still be filled by nomination in the foreign office there is a combination of nomination and competitive examinations the education department is recruited mainly from the universities by nomination but the great mass of civil service appointments are given exclusively on the results of an examination which is both open and competitive consequently since eighteen seventy the higher ranks of the civil services have commanded some of the best brains of the nation much more thorny was the question of army reform but mr gladstone had put at the war office one of his ablest lieutenants Mr. Edward Cardwell was, like his chief, the son of a Liverpool merchant. Educated at Winchester and Balliol, he found a seat in the House of Commons before he was thirty, and served his official apprenticeship under Peel. As president of the Board of Trade from 1852 to 1855, he was responsible for the Merchant Shipping Act of 1854. In subsequent ministries, he served as Chief Secretary for Ireland and Secretary of State for the Colonies. He brought, therefore, to the War Office in 1868 wide administrative experience and a high reputation for firmness and tact. Like his colleague Lowe, he was a stern economist of the Manchester School and disliked the desertion of laissez-faire principles implicit in the Irish Land Act of 1870 but he had other opportunities for enforcing them. It was the dominant maxim of the Manchester School that the colonies should be gradually prepared for independence. To this end, the British garrisons had been already withdrawn from Australia and New Zealand. Mr. Cardwell carried the same principle much further. When he took office, the number of British soldiers in the colonies was 49,000 by 1870 he had reduced them to about 18,000. The military expenditure on the colonies he reduced in the same period from £3,388,023 to £1,905,538. Of the latter sum, a large proportion was expended on imperial garrisons in stations, such as Malta and Gibraltar, and Cardwell reckoned the strictly colonial expenditure in 1870 at less than £700,000. It was Cardwell's hope and belief that diminished expenditure might go hand in hand with increased efficiency. His first task, therefore, was to complete the reorganization of the War Office itself. Down to 1855, the confusion which characterized army administration was appalling but the Crimean War necessitated a measure of reform, the main outlines of which have been already described. Cardwell completed the process. He assigned the business of his office to three departments under the Commander-in-Chief, the Surveyor-General of the Ordnance, 
and the financial secretary respectively and all were brought under the control of the secretary of state the subordination of the commander-in-chief to the parliamentary minister was emphasized by the removal of the headquarters staff from the horse guards to the war office this change involved an encroachment upon one of the most cherished prerogatives of the crown the sovereign had hitherto regarded the army as peculiarly her own domain and the commander-in-chief as in a special sense her servant his subordination to the secretary of state terminated his immediate dependence on the crown and it was with ill-concealed reluctance that the queen signed the order in council june twenty eighth eighteen seventy which gave effect to the policy of her responsible advisers it may be added that in nineteen o four the position was further simplified by the abolition of the office of commander-in-chief having put in order the administrative machinery cardwell next turned to the reorganization of the army itself the success of prussian arms in the wars against austria and france naturally attracted the attention of military reformers to the system by which so brilliant a result had been achieved it also raised anxious questionings as to the efficiency of our own system the idea of compulsory service the basis of the prussian system was considered but only to be deliberately rejected that point settled cardwell bent all his energies to making our small volunteer army as efficient as possible in moving the army estimates for eighteen seventy one mr cardwell put forward an elaborate statement of his scheme the estimates which had shown considerable reduction in the two previous years amounted to fifteen million eight hundred and fifty one thousand seven hundred pounds an increase of nearly three million pounds over the vote for eighteen seventy for this sum the country was to have four hundred and ninety seven thousand men under arms one hundred and thirty five thousand regulars of whom one hundred and eight thousand would be in england nine thousand first army reserve thirty thousand second army reserve and pensioners one hundred and thirty nine thousand militia fourteen thousand yeomanry and one hundred and seventy thousand volunteers the whole of this force was to be unified and to be controlled by the war office and the commander-in-chief this process involved two changes of first-rate importance the transfer of the control of the auxiliary forces from the lord lieutenants to the crown and the abolition of the system by which commissions in the regular army were obtained by purchase vested interests were to be safeguarded officers were to receive not only the regulation price they had paid for commissions but the additional price sanctioned by long usage this would involve a sum of seven million pounds to eight million pounds but the house of commons agreed to pay the price the lords however accepted an amendment declining to give a second reading to the army regulation bill until they had before them the complete plan of army reorganization avoiding a direct affirmation in favour of an intolerable abuse the lords had nevertheless scotched the government scheme but they had not killed it they had not reckoned on the constitutional or unconstitutional resourcefulness of the prime minister mr gladstone met the action of the lords by a startling coup d'etat on july twentieth the simultaneous statements were made by the leaders of the two houses that the government had advised the queen to take the decisive step of cancelling the royal warrant by which purchase is legal that her majesty had agreed to sign a warrant to that effect and then on november first eighteen seventy one purchase would cease to exist meanwhile the parliament would be invited to proceed with the compensation scheme contained in the army bill that bill duly became law but the lords in assenting to the second reading added a resolution that the conduct of the government was calculated to depreciate and neutralize the independent action of the legislature and was strongly to be condemned that the ministers were technically within their legal rights is undeniable equally undeniable is it that their use of executive authority 
was to the last degree daring if not dangerous that their action should have aroused intense excitement was only according to expectation mr disraeli denounced it as part of an avowed and shameful conspiracy against the undoubted privileges of the other house of parliament others deprecated such a distorted abuse of the royal prerogative technically however the action involved neither the abuse nor the use of the prerogative as both lord granville and mr gladstone were careful to insist this particular power of the crown was statutory action being taken under the provisions of forty nine george the third c one twenty six nevertheless as mr freeman the constitutional historian said the thing had an ill look mr gladstone had two courses before him he might abolish purchase by a royal warrant that is by using the discretion which parliament had given to the crown or he might bring a bill into parliament what gave the thing an ill look was that having chosen the second way and not being able to carry his point that way he then fell back on the first way i believe he added with shrewd insight that this is one of those cases in which a strictly conscientious man like mr gladstone does things from which a less conscientious man would shrink not less important than the change in the tenure of the officers was that in the enlistment of the men in eighteen twenty nine the principle of enlistment for life had been for the first time adopted recruits were on these terms difficult to get a large portion of them were obtained through the lying stories of recruiting sergeants poured into the ears of country yokels befuddled with drink in fact they were to a large extent nothing more nor less than kidnapped in eighteen forty seven the term of enlistment was reduced to twelve years in the first instance but men were encouraged to re-enlist for a further period of nine years or even longer the result was naturally a great deficiency of reserves this deficiency mr cardwell attempted to supply by continuing enlistment for twelve years six of which were to be spent with the colours and six in a special reserve soldiers with the colours were to be taught a trade and reservists were to receive fourpence a day the scheme has proved a great success a better class of men have been attracted to the ranks and the reservists whenever called upon to mobilize have responded with alacrity and enthusiasm another part of cardwell's scheme was to evoke local patriotism by associating each regiment with a territorial district the country was divided into districts from each of which were to be raised a regiment of the line consisting of two linked battalions one serving at home the other abroad while the militia and the volunteers were to be brought into close relation with the regular battalions this portion of cardwell's scheme has been only partially successful but it cannot be denied that for the first time a great army administrator had attempted to work out a far-sighted and comprehensive scheme and with unusual persistence and skill to adapt limited means to illimitable ends the lot of an army reformer is not a happy one in military circles there was hardly a good word for the war minister yet mr cardwell achieved the most brilliant success of the session of eighteen seventy one though he achieved it at the cost of alienating a powerful section of society the home secretary mr bruce alienated another section even more powerful and without anything to show for it for the licensed victuallers while not less articulate in their opposition than the colonels were far more successful the cause of their agitation was the abortive licensing bill of eighteen seventy one the bill proposed that existing licensees should subject to good conduct and the payment of a small annual sum remain undisturbed for ten years at the termination of that period the magistrates were to determine the number of public houses required for a district put the privilege of conducting them up to auction and apply the proceeds to the maintenance of a special public house police force and other purposes for the benefit of the district the bill which was not very wisely conceived seriously alarmed the trade 
and did not evoke enthusiasm among ardent temperance reformers. It had little hold on life and perished prematurely. A much more modest measure was placed upon the statute book in 1872. Public houses were to be closed at 12 o'clock in London and at 11 o'clock in the country, unless the justices in the latter case fixed another time between 10 o'clock and midnight, and during certain hours on Sundays. The Act also contained provisions to secure the purity of the liquor sold, but though modest, it was not popular, and taken in conjunction with its abortive predecessor, aroused against the government the suspicious hostility of a powerful class. The hostility of another class was aroused by Mr. Goshen's bill for the reform of local government and the readjustment of local rates. The main feature of the bill was the immediate transference of half the local rates from the occupier to the owner, but as it failed even to reach a second reading, the details need not detain us. More serious for the prestige of the ministry than the abandonment of the legislative projects of Mr. Bruce and Mr. Goshen was the defeat sustained by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in regard to his proposed match tax. Low was a purist, not to say a pedant in finance, but down to 1871 he had been, for so clever a man, unexpectedly successful at the Exchequer. In 1869 he had been able, by an ingenious alteration in the date of payment, to take a penny off the income tax, and had largely reduced the taxes on locomotion. He had also, with characteristic pedantry, abolished the one shilling registration duty on imported corn. The tax brought in nearly a million a year and hurt nobody. In 1870, thanks to diminished expenditure on armaments, he had taken a further penny off the income tax, thus reducing it to fourpence. He had reduced the sugar duty by 50 per cent and had abolished the newspaper stamp and the duty on railway passengers. But in 1871, fortune deserted him. Cardwell wanted an extra three millions for the army, and this Lowe proposed to raise in three ways, by a complicated readjustment of the income tax, which would have increased the rate by slightly more than one and a quarter pence in the pound, by an increase in the probate and succession duties, and by a small tax on matches ex luce lucellum. All these proposals were unpopular, and the last raised an agitation out of all proportion to the intrinsic importance of the proposal. The cabinet gave way. All Mr. Lowe's over-ingenious devices were abandoned, and an extra two pence on the income tax provided in humdrum fashion for the estimated deficit. The tuppence came off again in 1872, and a third penny in 1873, but Mr. Lowe never recovered his prestige. In 1873, an administrative scandal brought his own career at the Exchequer to an abrupt and inglorious close, and still further damaged the credit of the Cabinet in which he continued to sit as Home Secretary. Long before 1873, however, the tide had begun to turn against the Liberal government. Their appetite for legislation had been prodigious, and the digestion of the country proved to be less robust than their own. Apart from the larger statutes already described, there stands to the credit of their industry a long list of useful measures. The Trades Union Act of 1871, the Mines Act of 1872, the Extradition Act, the Naturalization Act, and the Foreign Enlistment Act all part of the copious crop of 1870 and the Bank Holiday Act of 1871, the credit for which belongs, however, not to the ministry, but to one who attained eminence as a banker, a man of science, a social philosopher and a legislator, Sir John Lubbock, afterwards Lord Avebury. To the above list must be added two other acts of considerable importance, the Ballot Act, of 1872 and the Judicature Act of 1873. Vote by ballot had formed a part of the program of the Society for Constitutional Information in 1780 and 
the demand reappeared in a declaration of rights drafted in eighteen thirty one and again in the people's charter of eighteen thirty seven but there was a strong prejudice not confined to conservative politicians against the principle of secret voting and not until after the election of 1868 did it become a question of practical politics. A committee was appointed in 1869 to inquire into the whole subject of the conduct of parliamentary elections, and in 1870 Lord Hartington introduced a bill to abolish public nomination and to establish secret voting. Withdrawn in 1870, an amended bill was passed through the Commons in 1871. In the meantime, an argument from experience had been furnished by the first election for the London School Board, which was elected by ballot. But the Lords, exacerbated by the royal warrant on army purchase, contemptuously rejected the bill. Their attitude stiffened the back of Mr. Gladstone, hitherto lukewarm about the ballot, and in September 1871 he declared that the People's Bill has been passed by the people's house and when it was next presented at the door of the house of lords it would be with an authoritative knock in eighteen seventy two the lords gave way the ballot bill became law but without the just and valuable provision contained in the original bill of eighteen seventy one by which the expenses of parliamentary elections would have been thrown upon the rates the most important legislative achievement of the session of 1873 was an act for the reorganization and simplification of the work of the judicature. This was due to the initiative of Sir Roundell Palmer, who, on the resignation of Lord Hatherley, had become Lord Chancellor and had been elevated to the peerage as Lord Selborne. Down to 1873, the judicial system was chaotic there existed no less than eight superior courts of first instance, the King's or Queen's Bench, the Common Pleas, the Court of Exchequer, the Chancery Court, the High Court of Admiralty, the Court of Bankruptcy, the Court of Probate, and the Court for Divorce and Matrimonial Cases. Most of these courts had separate staffs of judges. Lord Selborne's Act of 1873 was the first step in the evolution of order out of the chaos, which, however interesting to the antiquarian, was distracting to litigants and lamentably wasteful both of time and money. Lord Selborne's Act was amended in 1875, 1876, and 1894 and was supplemented by an important order in Council of December 16, 1880. It may conduce to economy of space and lucidity to omit the chronological details and summarize the broad results. In place of the numerous courts mentioned above with their varieties of procedure and conflict of jurisdictions, we have now got one Supreme Court of Judicature, divided into one, the High Court of Justice, and two, the Court of Appeal. The former has three divisions. One, the King's Bench Division, which now exercises the jurisdiction formerly exercised by the Courts of King's Bench, Common Pleas, and Exchequer, and the Court of Bankruptcy. The Lord Chief Justice acts as President, assisted by a staff of 15 judges. Number 2. The Chancery Division, under the Lord Chancellor, and six other judges. And number 3. The Probate, Divorce, and Admiralty Divisions, under the President and one other judge. The judges of the High Court act also as judges of assize on circuit. From the High Court, including courts of assize, an appeal lies to the Court of Appeal. This court consists of three ex officio judges, the Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief Justice, and the President of the Probate, Divorce, and Admiralty Division, and six permanent judges, namely the Master of the Rolls and five Lord Justices of Appeal. Finally, from this Court of Appeal and from the Scotch and Irish courts, an appeal lies to the House of Lords. In the course of the judicial reforms now under notice, the Lords went near to losing their historic rights of appellate jurisdiction. By Lord Selborne's Act of 1873, these rights were extinguished and transferred to the new Court of Appeal. Before the Act came into operation, however, the clause relating to the House of Lords was rescinded, 
and by the Judicature Act of 1876, the appellate jurisdiction of the House of Lords was for the first time placed upon a statutory basis. Provision was made for the creation immediately of two, ultimately of four, salaried law lords, to be known as Lords of Appeal in Ordinary. Thenceforward, no appeal was to be heard unless at least three Lords of Appeal were present, such Lords including not only the salaried law lords, but the Chancellor, ex-Chancellors, and any other peers who hold or have held high judicial office. The right of lay peers to take part in the judicial work of their house remains unaffected by the Act of 1876, but it is never exercised. The Act of 1876 also effected considerable changes in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. The Lords of Appeal and Ordinary, designated primarily for work in the House of Lords, were to act also on the Judicial Committee. At the same time, it was provided that the archbishops and such bishops as are members of the Privy Council should no longer be members of the Judicial Committee, though they might continue to be summoned as assessors for the hearing of ecclesiastical appeals. To the same committee the King may also appoint persons who have served as Indian or colonial judges. In effect, however, the composition of the Judicial Committee is almost identical with that of the House of Lords sitting in a judicial capacity. Lord Selborne's Judicature Act, especially as amended later, was an exceedingly valuable installment of administrative reform. It was not a party measure. It was hardly a contentious one. Nevertheless, it contributed to an impression which was beginning to prevail that no institution, however venerable, was secure from the hands of the reformer. Ever since 1871, the tide of government popularity had been unequivocally on the ebb. They had attempted not only to do too much, but to do it too quickly. In a telling phrase, Disraeli charged them with having legalized confiscation, consecrated sacrilege, and condoned high treason. This was the criticism of a partisan. But many besides partisans were becoming uneasy. The repose of almost all the comfortable classes had during the last five years been rudely disturbed. Landlords, churchmen, lawyers, brewers, all felt that the innovator was abroad in the land, and many who approved strongly of the domestic reforms of the liberal ministers were dissatisfied by their conduct of foreign affairs. To the latter question, we must now turn. The year 1870-1871 is frequently accounted the zenith of the liberal movement of the 19th century in England. It certainly marked the climax of the century upon the continent of Europe. It witnessed the transference of the Italian capital from Florence to Rome and the consummation of Italian unity, the consolidation of Germany under a great federal empire, the establishment of the Third Republic in France, the final assertion of Russian claims in the Black Sea, and the promulgation of the doctrine of papal infallibility, by the Vatican Council. Such events, even had they stood alone, could not have failed to affect the position of Great Britain in the European economy. The sequel will show that they did not. With the movement which culminated in the union of North and South Italy under Victor Emmanuel, we have already dealt. On February 18, 1861, a parliament which was for the first time representative of nearly all parts of Italy assembled at Turin, but the work was still woefully incomplete. In the web of Italian unity there were still two gaping rents. The Austrians were still in Venezia. French troops were still protecting the remnant of the temporal power in Rome. The mending of both rents modern Italy owes to Bismarck. Early in 1865, the Prussian ambassador at Florence approached La Marmora, the Italian minister, with reference to a possible combination of Italy and Prussia against the common enemy, Austria. La Marmora wisely refused to put himself unreservedly into the hands of Prussia, and after the conclusion of the Convention of Gastein, 
August 14, 1865, La Marmora sent an envoy to Vienna to sound the Emperor Francis Joseph as to the possibility of an amicable cession of Venezia to Italy. La Marmora offered to pay a large sum of money and to assume part of the national debt of Austria. The overture was haughtily declined by the Emperor. His decision at this moment proved to be of crucial importance. Had he accepted La Marmora's terms, the whole course of European history might have been changed. The Seven Weeks' War and the Franco-German War might have been almost indefinitely postponed. Austria might still be a part of Germany. Alsace and Lorraine might still be in the hands of France. The last obstacle in Bismarck's path had in reality been removed. In September of 1865, the Prussian minister met the French emperor at Biarritz. The blunt German, regarded by his host as a mere amateur in diplomacy, simply played with the master of intrigue. Bismarck went to Biarritz with two objectives, to induce Napoleon to help him to an alliance with Italy and to secure Napoleon's benevolent neutrality in the coming struggle with Austria he came away from Biarritz a happy man. Both objects had been attained, and he had given in exchange nothing but verbal promises. On April 8, 1866, Prussia concluded an alliance offensive and defensive with Italy. If within three months Prussia should take up arms for the reform of the Germanic Bund, Italy undertook to declare war upon Austria. The price of the bargain was the cession of Venezia. Too late, the Austrian emperor perceived the blunder he had committed. At the eleventh hour, he made a frantic effort to come to terms with Victor Emmanuel on the basis of the cession of Venezia. But Italy had given Austria her chance. She had now made her bargain with Prussia, and to this bargain she faithfully adhered. The consequence was that in the Seven Weeks' War, Austria had not one enemy to confront but two. The triumph of Prussian arms was so rapid and complete that Bismarck might have done without Italy. But in matters of moment he left nothing to chance. Italy reaped no glory from the war, but she got her price, Venezia, from the peace. There remained only Rome. Cavour had declared that without Rome for a capital, Italy can never be firmly united. But Cavour had appreciated the diplomatic difficulties, Garibaldi and Mazzini never did. To them, the remnant of the temporal power seemed like a spear-point embedded in a living body. Flouting all the worldly wisdom of the diplomatists, they had been eager, directly after the conquest of the two Sicilies in 1861, to make an assault upon Rome. The story of Garibaldi's generous folly on the one side, and on the other that of the blunders of the Italian government, deprived of the statesmanship of Cavour, footnote, died 1861, and footnote, need not be retold. Enough to say that with the opening of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, the long-drawn agony was ended. If Austria was obstinate in 1865, Napoleon was demented in 1870. On the eve of the Franco-German War, he refused to abandon the cause of the Pope. Better the Prussians at Paris than the Pied de Montese in Rome, the Empress is reported to have said. But the dilemma was fallacious. On August 19th, the last French soldiers left Civitavecchia. A month later, September 20th, the Italians, beating down the weak resistance of the Pope's troops, entered Rome, and the Italian tricolor floated from the capital. The Pope still refused to come to terms with Victor Emmanuel, a plebiscite declared in favor of annexation. On June 2, 1871, the king made his triumphal entry into his new capital, and on November 27, a parliament, representative for the first time of every part of Italy, was opened in Rome. At last, Italy was won. End of section 43.
Section 44 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 22 Administrative Reform and Foreign Affairs, 1868 to 1874, Part 2. Before Victor Emmanuel had entered Rome, the Second French Empire had ceased to be, and King William I of Prussia had been proclaimed First German Emperor in the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. The immediate antecedents of these astonishing events demand a brief note. It is France, said Marshal Random, which has been conquered at Sadova. It was true. The rapidity and completeness of the Prussian victories entirely upset the calculations of Napoleon, and his diplomacy between 1866 and 1870 was marked by a series of blunders, each one of which served only to draw him more tightly into the coils prepared for him by Bismarck. The latter prepared grimly for the next step in his carefully premeditated diplomacy. So far back as 1866, he had avowed his conviction that a war with France would succeed the war with Austria lay in the logic of history, and that such a war was a necessary preliminary to the construction of a united Germany. Napoleon also believed war to be inevitable. The Empress believed it to be essential to the maintenance of the dynasty, and held that if war had to come, the sooner the better for France. Napoleon's health was failing, and he knew that the military strength of Prussia was increasing much faster than that of France. Feverishly he sought alliances with Austria, with Italy, with Russia. The negotiations with Austria had gone far, but the Roman entanglement impeded negotiations with Italy, and when the war cloud burst, France was still without allies. By 1869, Bismarck was ready, but he was anxious that the offensive should come from France. He found, or rather made, his opportunity in the Hohenzollern candidature for the throne of Spain. Having got rid of their disreputable Queen Isabella, the Spaniards in 1869 declared for a constitutional monarchy, and Bismarck contrived that the throne should be offered to a cadet of the Prussian house, Prince Leopold of Hohenzollern Siegmaringen. Prince Leopold hung back, but in 1870, 50,000 pounds of Prussian bonds were transferred to Madrid. The offer was renewed, and on July 4th was accepted. It was perfectly well known in Berlin that Prince Leopold's acceptance of the crown of Spain would be regarded as a casus belli by Napoleon and on July 4th the latter sent a formal intimation to this effect. On July 12th, Prince Leopold, at his own instance, withdrew his candidature, and Bismarck's diplomatic structure tottered. Once more war seemed to have been averted. The French Prime Minister, M. Olivier, declared that the crisis was over. But there were at least two people in France who were not less eager for war than Bismarck himself. France, therefore, with incredible folly, required that the King of Prussia should not merely express his formal approval of Prince Leopold's revocation, but should also promise that he would not again authorize his candidature. This insolent demand was presented to the Prussian King at Ems by Benedetti, the French ambassador, July 13th. The king courteously declined to go beyond his approval of the revocation, and as Benedetti was importunate, sent him word through an aide-de-camp that he had nothing further to say to the ambassador. The king telegraphed the news to Bismarck at Berlin, and left it to his minister to decide whether it should be communicated to the diplomatists and to the press. Bismarck's opportunity had come. He took brief counsel with Moltke and Rune, and showed them the telegram he had prepared for publication. You have converted, said Moltke, surrender into defiance. He had. 
but to describe his telegram as forged is an abuse of language the terms in which he communicated his master's message to the ambassadors and to the press were deliberately designed to inflame passions both in paris and berlin his object was attained the parisian populace demanded war and the empress eugenie and the duc de gramont pressed it upon the emperor and a reluctant cabinet napoleon was not ready and he knew it but on july fourteenth the french cabinet by a majority of one vote decided on war the french declaration reached berlin on july nineteenth with consummate adroitness bismarck had exhibited france in the eyes of europe as a wanton aggressor the rapid sequence of events took the english cabinet completely by surprise the prime minister was absorbed in other matters and the one member of his cabinet who might have intervened with effect to avert war passed away on june twenty seventh lord clarendon was one of the safest if not one of the most brilliant foreign secretaries of the nineteenth century and his death at this critical moment was an irreparable loss both to england and to europe his successor lord granville who received the seals of the foreign office on july sixth on the same day that france publicly declared that she could not permit a foreign state to disturb the balance of power by placing one of her princes on the throne of charles v on the previous day lord granville had been informed by mr afterwards lord hammond under secretary at the foreign office that with the exception of the trouble caused by the recent murder of british subjects by brigands in greece he had never during his long experience known so great a lull in foreign affairs within twenty-four hours lord granville was immersed in a desperate effort to keep the peace of europe that effort was of course abortive on july twentieth bavaria decided to join prussia the adhesion of south germany not only added one hundred and fifty thousand men to the forces at the disposal of prussia but shut the door in the face of france within three weeks roon had poured five hundred thousand troops into france and had another five hundred thousand ready to start on august second the war began exactly a month later september second napoleon surrendered to the king of prussia at sedan the emperor himself and eighty thousand frenchmen became prisoners of war the first phase of the war had ended in a splendid triumph for the german arms the military debacle was immediately followed by a political revolution the empire collapsed a republic was proclaimed september fourth and the empress fled to england a government of national defence was hastily formed under jules favre gambetta and general trochu the governor of paris m favre declared that the republic would not yield a stone of a french fortress nor an inch of french soil this valorous declaration did not facilitate the conclusion of peace the siege of paris began on september twentieth and despite the desperate efforts of gambetta to relieve it the capital surrendered on january twenty eighth eighteen seventy one the germans then granted an armistice to allow the election of a national assembly which met at bordeaux february twelfth and elected the veteran statesman thiers head of state preliminaries of peace were signed in february and finally ratified at frankfurt on may tenth france was compelled to cede to germany the whole of alsace except belfort and eastern lorraine together with the great fortresses of metz and strasbourg and to pay the vast indemnity of five milliards of francs within three years until the indemnity was paid german troops were to remain in occupation of the french fortresses lord granville as we have seen had made every effort to avert war when it was declared he announced and observed complete neutrality by both parties however his attitude was suspected English opinion was at first profoundly hostile to France, who was regarded as the wanton disturber of European peace. These feelings were still further inflamed when on July 25th, 
the times published the text of a draft treaty which it was alleged had been submitted on behalf of the emperor napoleon to bismarck in eighteen sixty six it virtually provided for the absorption of belgium by france bismarck himself communicated the treaty from obvious motives to the times and followed up the startling disclosure by an elaborate vindication of his own virtue the french government repudiated bismarck's account of the matter and the emperor himself declared from his camp at metz that it was bismarck who offered him belgium and that he had refused it whatever the truth as to the original transaction it was not easy to justify bismarck's disclosure nor the moments selected for it but the diplomatic controversy that ensued was not without advantage to great britain it rendered both prussia and france eager to assent to lord granville's suggestion that the treaty of eighteen thirty nine guaranteeing the integrity of belgium should be renewed and its terms even more rigorous and specific this revised treaty was signed on august ninth and shortly afterwards the terms were extended to include luxembourg meanwhile no diplomatic assurances sufficed to convince prussia that the neutrality of england was otherwise than malevolent towards her the english are more hated at this moment than the french and lord granville more than benedetti thus the crown princess wrote from berlin to the queen on august ninth eighteen seventy at this moment there was no justification for these sentiments a month later there was after the fall of the empire public opinion in england veered round in favour of the defeated combatant on september twenty first the queen telephoned to king william to express the hope that he would make peace in a generous spirit lord granville sent a special envoy to the german headquarters to persuade bismarck to meet jules favre the king and his chancellor were equally unyielding france was beaten and germany must make herself secure if possible for all time on september thirteenth m thiers arrived in london to beg lord granville to initiate a movement for european mediation on behalf of france the english minister received him cordially but sent him away empty nothing short of armed intervention proposed to the combatants by all the great neutral powers acting in concert would as lord granville conceived have been of the least avail france however was convinced that england might have done more prussia thought that she ought to have done less what chance there was of concerted action among the neutrals the next move in the diplomatic game will show in october eighteen seventy prince gortchakoff addressed to the powers a circular denouncing on behalf of russia the black sea clauses of the treaty of paris eighteen fifty six article eleven of that treaty declared the black sea is neutralized its waters and its ports thrown open to the mercantile marine of every nation are formally and in perpetuity interdicted to the flag of war either of the powers possessing its coasts or of any other power certain unimportant exceptions were made by articles nineteen and twenty but by article thirteen the czar and the sultan engaged not to establish or maintain upon that coast any military maritime arsenal these were the famous articles which russia now seized the opportunity by her sole and individual action to denounce the step if not actually suggested was certainly approved beforehand by bismarck nor was it really unexpected russia had long chafed under the restrictions and it was reasonably certain that she would take the first chance of escaping from them gortchakoff cynically referred to the infringements to which most european transactions have been laterally exposed and in the face of which it would be difficult to maintain that the written law retains the moral validity which it may have possessed at other times in plain english the czar saw no reason why he should observe treaties when other people broke them it ought not to escape notice that both for russia and great britain 
the question of naval power in the Black Sea had acquired a new significance by the recent, 1869, opening of the canal across the Isthmus of Suez. Even yet, perhaps, the world has hardly realized the profound influence that event is destined to exercise upon Weltpolitik. It certainly was not realized in 1870. Virtually, however, there were but two courses open to Great Britain, to acquiesce in the bold and cynical action of the Tsar, or without allies, to fight him. To declare war upon Russia at this juncture would be to provoke the Armageddon which England was using all her endeavours to avert. And was the game worth the candle? Lord Derby said that he would fight for the neutrality of Egypt, but not for the neutrality of the Black Sea. And he expressed the best opinion on the subject. In face of it, Lord Granville had no option but to get out of a disagreeable business with as little loss of prestige as possible. Bismarck was induced to invite the great powers to a conference to discuss the questions raised by Prince Gorchakov's circular. Great Britain assented on condition that the conference met not at St. Petersburg but in London, and that it should not assume any portion of the treaty to have been abrogated by the discretion of a single power. This may be regarded as solemn farce. The conclusion was foregone, but it was making the best of a bad job. The conference met in London in December, and Lord Granville got all the satisfaction he could out of a solemn protocol, declaring it to be an essential principle of the law of nations that no power can liberate itself from the engagements of a treaty, and unless with the consent of the contracting powers by means of an amicable arrangement. For the rest, Russia got what she wanted. The modification of the Treaty of Paris was duly recorded in the Treaty of London, March 13, 1871. That English prestige suffered from the tearing up of the Treaty of Paris can hardly be denied but a still more difficult question awaited solution. Ever since the American Civil War, relations between Great Britain and the United States had been severely strained. Neither party to the war was satisfied with our attitude. The North regarded our neutrality as rather more than malevolent. The South thought it inadequately benevolent. More specifically, there was the question of the damage inflicted upon American commerce by the Alabama and other cruisers. On this question, the attitude of England had undergone some modification. Lord Russell, the minister primarily responsible, had repudiated all responsibility, though he lived to make a manly confession that he had been to blame. Lord Clarendon, however, in 1869, concluded a convention which virtually admitted that the damage inflicted by the cruisers upon individuals was a matter for negotiation. But of this the American Senate would not hear. They persisted that between the two nations there was outstanding a national question which demanded speedy settlement. More than this, the most extravagant demands were put forward. Great Britain was to be held responsible not merely for provable damage inflicted upon individuals, but for the actual prolongation of the war and the expenses incidental thereto. These indirect claims, as they came to be called, were roughly estimated at four hundred million pounds. Mr. Gladstone himself reckoned that four times that sum would have barely covered them. The Americans doubtless said a great deal more than they meant, but feelings were exceedingly bitter, and war might very easily have ensued, but for the extraordinary forbearance and restraint of the English cabinet and the English parliament. Early in 1871, the two countries agreed on a joint commission to discuss not only the Alabama claims, but all other questions outstanding between them. The English commissioners were Lord de Grey and Ripon, Sir Stafford Northcote, Sir John A. Macdonald, representing Canada, Sir Edward Thornton, minister at Washington, and Mr. Montague Bernard, professor of international law at Oxford. In 
the commission opened at washington on february twenty seventh and after more than two months of difficult and delicate negotiations the treaty of washington was signed nothing but great forbearance on the part of lord de grey and ripon and his colleagues could have saved the situation they proposed that all the questions not decided in the treaty which they hoped to conclude should be submitted to a body of arbitrators the americans insisted that the arbitration should itself be governed by certain new principles of international law which were to be propounded in the treaty these principles were admittedly not accepted when the alabama had escaped from liverpool and the american demand was therefore illogical but the foreign enlistment act passed in england in eighteen seventy had made it a criminal offence to build a ship for use against a friendly belligerent power and the english commissioners therefore agreed as a friendly act that the arbitrator should assume that her majesty's government had undertaken to act upon the new principles the other chief impediment to an agreement was the question of the british counterclaims in regard to the fenian raids in canada but on this point also great britain gave way on may eighth eighteen seventy one the treaty of washington a portentous document consisting of forty-three articles was signed it expressed in a friendly spirit the regret felt by her majesty's government for the escape under whatever circumstances of the alabama and other vessels from british ports and for the depredation committed by those vessels it adjusted in minute detail outstanding disputes as to the fisheries between united states and canada and agreed to refer the question of the vancouver boundary involving the possession of the island of san juan to the arbitration of the german emperor who ultimately decided against great britain it accepted new principles of international law involving greater diligence in preventing the equipment of ships in neutral harbors for use against friendly belligerents and finally it agreed to refer the alabama claims themselves to a tribunal of five persons nominated by great britain the united states italy switzerland and brazil one difficult corner had thus been deftly turned another remained the arbitrators were to meet at Geneva on June 15, 1872. The English arbitrator was Chief Justice Coburn, and Sir Roundell Palmer acted as agent or counsel. At one moment, however, it seemed doubtful whether the Geneva Tribunal would ever meet. Before the end of 1871, the English government learnt that the American case insisted upon an adjudication not only upon the losses suffered by individual american citizens but upon the indirect constructive consequential and national claims first propounded in their full dimensions by mr sumner the government were not only disappointed but deeply incensed at the revival of this preposterous demand and none more so than mr gladstone who declared that we must be insane to accede to demands which no nation with a spark of honour or spirit left could submit to even at the point of death the cabinet though with varying degrees of emphasis were unanimously against the submission of the indirect claims the point had really been slurred at washington if the americans had insisted on specific inclusion or the english on specific exclusion there would have been no treaty of arbitration the moderate men on both sides hoped that they would be ruled out by the arbitrators themselves and this was precisely what happened at geneva that it did happen was due to the high courage the true dignity and perfect tact of one man whose name should be had in everlasting remembrance charles francis adams the american nominee thanks to adams the tribunal met and in September 1872 it issued its award. It was unanimously against Great Britain as regards the Alabama, and by a majority on other claims. The sum awarded for damages in final settlement was about £3,250,000. It was a good deal cheaper than war, was the characteristic comment of Mr. Lowe. Eight years afterward, Mr. Gladstone said, although i may think the sentence was harsh in its extent and unjust in its basis 
i regard the fine imposed on this country as dust in the balance compared with the moral value of the examples set when these two great nations of england and america went in peace and concord before a judicial tribunal rather than resort to the arbitrament of the sword it was finely said and impartial history may applaud the sentiment but among contemporaries there was an uneasy sense that too many of the kicks had of late fallen to our share as for the government the geneva award added another item to its rapidly accumulating burden of unpopularity the appointment of sir robert collier to be a paid member of the judicial committee of the privy council though in itself unexceptionable was a flagrant violation of the spirit of the recent act the act provided that the paid member should have served on the bench sir robert never had but was appointed for a few days a justice of the court of common pleas to give him the technical qualification this was sailing too near the wind and the government escaped actual censure in the lords by only two votes and the commons by only twenty-seven the appointment of a cambridge graduate to the rectory of ulm seemed to be another though less important violation of law when the rectory had been divorced from the regius professorship of divinity it was provided that the rector should be a member of the convocation of oxford such things relatively unimportant in themselves were not calculated to prop up a tottering ministry but the final blow came perversely from an irish measure defeated on his irish university bill by a majority of three mr gladstone immediately placed his resignation in the hands of the queen march thirteenth eighteen seventy three the queen sent for disraeli but disraeli had no desire for another term of office without power nor did he wish to check the coming conservative revival by a premature and purposeless dissolution the pair he judged in a party sense was nearly but not quite ripe he judged wisely mr gladstone resumed office with a very bad grace march twentieth a shifting of cabinet offices did nothing to redeem the popularity of the ministry and the credit for the success of a little war accrued justly enough to the soldiers a deal with the dutch had lately transferred to great britain some forts on the african gold coast in june of eighteen seventy three the native ashantis disliking the change attacked the protectorate in force sir garnet wolseley was sent out in command of a punitive expedition penetrated through the unhealthy jungle to kumasi the ashanti capital burnt the palace in town imposed terms on king kafi kalkali and returned triumphant the whole expedition was planned with the forethought and executed with the punctuality and success which the world has long since associated with the name of its commander before he and his troops returned to england march eighteen seventy four the government which had sent them out had fallen in january eighteen seventy four mr gladstone had informed the queen that the cabinet had resolved to advise an immediate dissolution as the best means of putting an end to the disadvantage and weakness of a false position the position was possibly false it was certainly weak and its weakness was due to many causes in combination to an overloading and still more an overweighting of the parliamentary ship to several legislative failures to one administrative scandal and more than one equivocal use of patronage to cabinet divisions which not even the high authority of the premier could wholly check to a sense of lowered prestige abroad and weakened vitality at home to a remarkable series of governmental defeats and by-elections above all to the political anticlimax which had ensued on the defeat of the ministry in march eighteen seventy three on top of all this gladstone had made up his mind to the greatest financial plunge of his career at the exchequer the abolition of the income tax this was no deathbed repentance or hustings inspiration but for the crimean war he might have done it nearly twenty years before if he could obtain the assistance of cardwell and goshen now at the head of the two great spending departments he believed himself to be at last in a position to accomplish it 
their help was doubtful, but the Premier clearly hoped much from an appeal to the country. We dissolve, he wrote, on finance. His programme, as put before the country, was threefold. Number one, repeal of the income tax. Number two, relief and readjustment of local taxation. Number three, remission of taxes on articles of general consumption. It was not for nothing that Mr. Gladstone had gone back to the Exchequer. The constituencies, however, refused the bait from Mr. Gladstone, and they never got another chance of swallowing it. In England, the Tories swept the country. Even in Scotland and Wales, there was some weakening of the liberal defences. The home rulers came fifty-eight strong from Ireland. In the event, the Tories had a clear majority of over fifty in the House of Commons, reckoning all the home rulers as opponents. Mr. Gladstone attributed his defeat, neither generously nor accurately, to a torrent of gin and beer, and to the coil of the education controversy. His colleagues preferred not to await the verdict of Parliament, and against his own judgment he gave way. On his resignation, the Queen sent for Mr. Disraeli. End of section 44. Section 45 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 23. The New Toryism, Imperium et Sanitas, 1874 to 1878, Part 1. Not for a whole generation had the Conservative Party been in power. Three times since the Great Schism of 1846 they had been in office, but always in a minority. Mr. Disraeli was now at the head of a party which commanded not only a large but a compact majority. His success in 1874 was due primarily, perhaps, to the blunders, unpopularity, and internal dissensions of his opponents, but not wholly. It was due partly to a gradual inclination of the mind and instinct of the electorate toward the objects for which modern conservatism was to stand. These objects had been in the last few years clearly restated and defined by the leader, who was now, in the late evening of his days, to reap the tardy reward of patience and sagacity. Disraeli was no mere opportunist. No one who takes the trouble to master the political philosophy which permeates his novels can accept that superficial view of his career. Those novels are at least as serious a contribution to political thought as the solemn treatises which Bolingbroke wrote for the instruction of his party in the first half of the eighteenth century. Bolingbroke is accounted the first great educator of the Tory party, and with reason. Compare the Toryism of Filmer with that of the younger Pitt, and you have the measure of the influence of Bolingbroke. George the Third learnt from the Patriot King the principles which he practised until he found a master in Chatham's son. George the Third may have been an indifferent king, but he was consummately successful as the reconstructor and leader of a party. Canning, had he lived, might have performed a similar service after 1830, though he was hardly less mistrusted than Bolingbroke. Sir Robert Peel attempted it, but succeeded only in creating the party which bore his name until it was absorbed into the new liberalism. Disraeli accomplished it, and alike in his novels and in his more elaborate speeches the influence of Bolingbroke is clearly traceable. The state is become, under ancient and known forms, a new and undefinable monster, composed of a king without monarchical splendor, a senate of nobles without aristocratical ascendancy, and a senate of commons without democratical freedom. Footnote. Dissertations on parties. End footnote. Disraeli might have taken this passage from Bolingbroke as the text of his great discourse at Manchester. The Manchester speech, April 3, 
1872, followed by one at the Crystal Palace, June 24, may be said to have defined the principles of the new Toryism and to have prepared the way for the victory at the polls in 1874. Those speeches demand close attention. In the forefront, Disraeli placed the maintenance of the historic institutions of the country. His party had been accused of having no program. The retort was singularly effective. If by a program is meant a plan to despoil churches and plunder landlords, I admit we have no program. If by a program is meant a policy which assails or menaces every institution and every interest, every class, and every calling in the country, I admit we have no program. The program of the Conservative Party is to maintain the constitution of the country. In that constitution, Disraeli laid a special stress, for reasons which will appear presently, on the upholding of the ancient monarchy of England. The second duty of the party was to uphold the empire of England, and the third, the elevation of the social condition of the people. Sanitas, sanitato, momnia sanitas, was the text of his discourse at Manchester. Opponents might deride it as a policy of sewage and shoddy, but the constitution, the empire, and social reform represented not merely the battle cry of an opportunist, but the carefully considered and coherent program of one who aspired not merely to win a transient victory at the polls, but to refound a party. The response and the reward came not in the conspicuous yet transitory triumph of 1874, but in the prolonged ascendancy of his party from 1886 to 1906. Disraeli himself could look forward to no prolonged tenure of power. He was now seventy years of age, and he had been in Parliament ever since the Queen came to the throne. He gathered round him a cabinet of great business ability. The Foreign Office was put in the safe and trusted hands of Lord Derby. Lord Cairns returned to the Woolsack. The rebels of 1867 were rewarded with two secretaryships of state, Lord Carnarvon taking the colonies, and Lord Salisbury, India. Sir Stafford Northcote, trained in the Peel Gladstone School, became Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Ward Hunt being transferred to the Admiralty. Mr. Gathorne Hardy, a brilliant fighter, went to the War Office. The Duke of Richmond led the Lords as President of the Council. Lord Malmesbury held the Privy Seal, and Lord John Manners was Postmaster General. The twelfth member of the Cabinet was a recruit, Mr. Richard Ashton Cross, a shrewd, level-headed Lancashire banker, who, like so many twelfth men, proved himself the success of the team. Sir Michael Hicks Beach, a country gentleman of great ability, became chief secretary to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, the Duke of Abercorn, and two other business-like squires, Sir Charles Adderley and Mr. Sclater Booth, presided respectively over the boards of trade and local government but the three squires were not included in the cabinet. Disraeli was determined, like all the best parliamentarians, that his cabinet should be not a debating society, but a consultative committee, and to compass that end he wisely kept it small. The new ministry began a little unsteadily, but soon settled down to work. Public interest centered during their first session on three ecclesiastical measures, the most important of which was not technically a government bill. The first was Lord Sandon's bill for the amendment of the Endowed Schools Act of 1869. Lord Sandon proposed, number one, to abolish the Endowed Schools Commission and to transfer its functions to the Charity Commission, and number two, to restore to the Church of England all schools which, according to the clear intentions of the founder, had been founded in connection with the reformed and established Church. The Commission had made all schools founded prior to the Act of Uniformity of 1662 undenominational. The intention was to reverse this policy, but the proposal evoked an opposition so strenuous that Disraeli gave way, dropped the second half of the bill, and contented himself 
with substituting the Charity Commission for the Special Commission set up by the Act of 1869. A second bill proposed to abolish lay patronage in the established Church of Scotland and to transfer it with some compensation to such lay patrons as were willing to accept it to the communicant members of the several congregations. This was the very point which had split the Presbyterian Church in twain forty years earlier, and the members of the Free Kirk strongly opposed this concession to their brethren of the establishment. Mr. Gladstone backed them and urged that such a measure logically involved reunion. But logic was ignored, Mr. Gladstone was overborne, and the Church of Scotland got their bill. The turn of the Church of England came next. The bishops were gravely concerned at the increase of lawlessness among a section of their clergy in regard to the services of the Church, and particularly in regard to the celebration of Holy Communion. The archbishops therefore introduced a bill, infelicitously described as a bill for the regulation of public worship, but really intended to provide a summary method for the enforcement of the Act of Uniformity. Archbishop Tate was not the man to have moved causelessly in so important and delicate a matter. Indeed, so loyal an Anglican as Lord Selborne confessed that it seemed to him impossible to deny that there had been a considerable growth of innovations upon the ritual authorized by the Book of Common Prayer, not casual or sporadic, but systematic, and with a tendency to increase, and of a nature dangerous to the order and security of the Church, and that it was equally difficult for the bishops to repress them under the powers of the existing law, and to leave them uncontrolled without incurring great responsibility. Mr. Gladstone took an opposite line and flung himself with ardor into the defense, as he conceived it, of ecclesiastical liberty. As originally proposed by the archbishop, the bill provided that judicial powers should be vested in the bishop of the diocese assisted by a board of assessors lay and clerical, with an appeal to the archbishop similarly assisted. To the lay peers, this procedure seemed too ecclesiastical, and prompted by Lord Shaftesbury, they substituted for the bishop and assessors a special judge for ecclesiastical causes, appointed by the archbishops with the approval of the crown, with an appeal to the judicial committee of the privy council, the bishop retaining the right to veto proceedings if they seemed to him frivolous. In the Commons, Disraeli practically adopted the bill as a government measure, and commended it to the House as a means for the suppression of ritualism. This description infuriated the high churchmen with Mr. Gladstone, drawn from semi-retirement, at their head. The ex-premier tabled an elaborate series of resolutions hostile to the bill, but finding the sense of the House against him, he gave way, and did not move them. Sir William Harcourt, brought all his Erastian zeal to the support of Disraeli, and the bill became law. Lord Selborne was sounded as to his willingness to become the judge under the Act, but prudently declined the ungrateful task. Lord Penzance accepted the post, and lived to regret that he had ever deserted the divorce court. His conspicuous failure to avert ecclesiastical legislation, which was in the highest degree distasteful to him, impelled Mr. Gladstone to a step already contemplated. He was now sixty-five, wearied and worried by forty years of politics and six years of premiership. His physician, with shrewd insight, declined to encourage his retirement, but he himself craved for an interval between Parliament and the grave. Directly after his defeat at the polls, he had intimated to his followers that they must not look for continuous leadership from him but the in-and-out arrangement proved unsatisfactory alike to them and to him. His incursions into the ecclesiastical fray were embarrassing to his party and disappointing to himself. Accordingly, in February 1875, he formally and definitely withdrew from the leadership of the Liberal Party, and Lord Hartington was selected to succeed him in the House of Commons. His only serious rival was Mr. Forster, but the Birmingham League still pursued with rancorous hostility the author of the Education Act, 
and Forster's claims were not pressed. But although Lord Hartington sat in Mr. Gladstone's seat, the latter looked to Lord Granville as his destined successor in the leadership as soon as the party should return to power. Meanwhile, the Tories settled quietly down to a course of unheroic but not the less useful legislation. Of Mr. Cross's Licensing Act of 1874 there is not much to be said. After their exaggerated denunciation of Mr. Bruce's Act, the trade naturally looked to the Tory party for legislation, but if they were satisfied with the Act of 1874, their expectations cannot have been high. Introduced with the object of curtailing the discretion of the magistrates and fixing by legislation the hours of closing in public houses, its net result was to fix 10 p.m. for the country, 11 p.m. for towns or populous places, but to leave it to magistrates to determine what was a populous place. When the Conservative Party came into power in 1874, agriculture had not begun to fall on the evil days which marked the 80s. But then, as always, it was to the interest of the community that the land of the country, limited as it is in amount, should be put to the best possible economic use. To this end, three things were especially important, that there should be no artificial restrictions upon the transfer of real property, that the title to it should be cheaply ascertainable and secure, and that every encouragement should be given alike to owner and occupier to effect improvements. Lord Cairns's Leases and Sales of Settled Estate Act, 1875, was intended to simplify sales and leases and to encourage the registration of titles, but its permissive character, coupled with the persistent opposition of family solicitors, rendered it ineffectual. More effective was Lord Cairns' Settled Land Act, which did not actually become law until 1882. The object of this act was to render it possible for a limited owner to sell his settled estates. Such sales were somewhat discouraged by the condition that the purchase money must be reinvested for the benefit of the reversioner, but the act has undeniably facilitated a free market in land. The Duke of Richmond's Agricultural Holdings Act of 1875 was intended to give security to tenants for capital invested in the soil. The chief objection urged against the bill was that its provisions were not made compulsory. Yet there is a great deal to be said for making legislation of this character experimentally permissive, and it is an argument not against, but in favor of the ability of the measure of 1875 to recall the fact that in 1883 it was found desirable to strengthen its provisions and make compensation for improvements compulsory. An Enclosure of Commons Act, passed in 1876, was of even wider import. Previous acts on the subjects, while promoting cultivation and providing for the compensation of commoners, had ignored the substantial though intangible interests of the public at large. It was the object of Mr. Cross's Act, while consolidating and simplifying the existing acts, to remedy this defect. They must, said Mr. Cross, take into consideration that which the people of this country wanted almost as much as food, the air which they breathed, and the health which they enjoyed. His bill, therefore, was intended less to facilitate enclosure than to preserve commons as open spaces in the interests of the community in general. Another act, affecting the agricultural interest in particular, but hardly less vitally the community at large, was the Contagious Diseases Animals Act of 1878. The act provided that all cattle should be slaughtered on landing from foreign countries unless the country of export was known to be free from cattle disease. The extreme free traders scented protection in the measure, but the agriculturalists argued with reason that it was useless to take stringent and expensive precautions against the spread of infection at home so long as diseased cattle could be imported from infected areas abroad. The solicitude of the government was not, however, confined to rural interests and pursuits. During his career at the Home Office, 
Mr. Cross succeeded in placing on the statute book two valuable measures for the further regulation of the work of women and children in factories and workshops. The Act of 1874 further reduced the hours of labour in factories, not without some protest from Mr. Henry Fawcett and other apostles of laissez-faire, and increased the responsibilities of inspectors. The Factory and Workshops Act of 1878 was primarily a great work of codification and consolidation, totally repealing no less than sixteen acts on the same subject with parts of others, but it had also noticeable features of its own. It remedied a defect in the Act of 1871 by bringing the inspectorate once more under the control of the central authority. It absolutely prohibited the employment of any child under ten years of age and limited other children to half-time. For women, it fixed a maximum of fifty-six and one-half hours work per week in textile factories and sixty hours in non-textile, and provided that no women should be employed continuously for more than four and a half hours in the former and five in the latter. It was this monumental piece of legislation which called forth from Lord Shaftesbury the declaration that two millions of people of this country would bless the day when Mr. Cross was asked to be Secretary of State for the Home Department. But the indefatigable minister was determined to earn the gratitude not of two millions but of twenty. From the regulation of the conditions of industry he passed to the conditions of home life. Mr. Cross's Artisans' Dwellings Acts of 1875 was the first serious attempt on the part of the Imperial Parliament to grapple with the problem of the housing of the poor. Glasgow and Edinburgh had proved what could be done by a local authority to clear insanitary areas and provide decent dwellings for the poor. Mr. Peabody and Sir Sidney Waterlow had shown what could be done by wealthy and enlightened individuals. It was left to a conservative Home Secretary to invoke the heavy hand of the imperial legislature. Every local authority was required to appoint a medical officer of health and an inspector of nuisances. On the report of the medical officer, the authority was empowered to acquire compulsorily an insanitary area at its ordinary value, to demolish the buildings thereon, and either itself erect improved dwellings or dispose of the site to those who undertook to do so. The act was in the first instance confined to London and large towns, and local authorities were only empowered, not compelled to act, but even so the act was an important installment of the policy of sewage. More significant, perhaps, but still in accord with general conservative tradition and with the principles recently enunciated by Disraeli, was the labor legislation of 1875 and 1876. Three acts in particular deserve notice in this connection, though they may be conveniently considered together. The Conspiracy and Protection of Property Act, 1875, the Employers and Workmen's Act, 1875, and the Trades Union Act, 1876. Taken in conjunction with the Trades Union Act of 1871, passed by Mr. Gladstone's government, these acts constitute such a remarkable reversal of public policy as to demand a brief retrospect. Down to the year 1871, trades unions had no legal existence or status. Brought into being by the sharp differentiation of industrial functions and the still sharper antagonism of economic interests, which were the first and least fortunate results of the Industrial Revolution, these associations of workmen were frowned upon by the legislature. The common law held all such combinations illegal as conspiracies in restraint of trade, and to the common law were added innumerable statutes passed by Parliament to prevent their formation. Under the law, as it existed at the beginning of the 19th century, any artisan who organized a strike or joined a trades union was a criminal and liable on conviction to imprisonment. The strike was a crime, the trade union was an unlawful association. 
in eighteen twenty four however a royal commission reported strongly against the combination laws as both ineffective and mischievous and by an act of that year they were repealed en bloc alike for masters and men the immediate consequences were so alarming that in eighteen twenty five the old law of conspiracy was reaffirmed but a limited right of combination was permitted the broad result was that the trades unions ceased to be necessarily criminal but they remained non-legal associations consequently their funds unprotected by the provisions of the friendly societies act of eighteen fifty five were at the mercy of any dishonest official despite this grave disadvantage trade unions multiplied rapidly between eighteen twenty five and eighteen sixty popular attention was first directed to this new labor movement in the year eighteen sixty six by the outrages committed by members of these associations in manchester sheffield and other industrial centres these disturbances led to the appointment of a royal commission on whose report the legislation of eighteen seventy one through eighteen seventy six was largely based these acts form the charter of trade unionism they not only gave to trade union funds the benefit of the friendly societies acts but relieved them as was supposed from liability to damages for the tortious acts of agents they legalized picketing so long as it stopped short of violence or intimidation and they placed trades unions in a position of legal privilege by mitigating the law of conspiracy in their favor mr cross's act of eighteen seventy five enacted that an agreement or combination by two or more persons to do or procure to be done any act in contemplation or furtherance of a trade dispute between employers and workmen shall not be indictable as a conspiracy if such act committed by one person would not be punishable as a crime thus combinations in furtherance of trade disputes are legally privileged such was the effect and such doubtless the intention of mr cross's legislation how far the state had travelled since eighteen twenty five and still more since eighteen hundred it is not necessary to insist another item in the plentiful crop of eighteen seventy five deserves a passing notice the chancellor of the exchequer had presided over a commission appointed by the late government to inquire into the position of the friendly societies the commission found that many of the societies suffered from incompetent and some of them from fraudulent management the object of the bill passed into law by sir stafford northcote was less to improve the friendly societies than to encourage and help them to improve themselves registration though not made compulsory was facilitated and encouraged model tables of contributions and benefits were to be prepared by the government and issued to societies which desired them additional facilities were given for audit and the periodical revaluation of assets the times described the bill as modest if not timid but northcote insisted that its tentative and permissive character was due not to timidity but to a deliberate view that the only and true way of bringing about a development of the virtue of providence among the people was to make them work it out for themselves and that one great desire ought to be to give fair play and full play to those institutions which have sprung from the people themselves the sentiment is admirable but it is of the kind to appeal rather to responsible statesmen than to enthusiastic philanthropists it was the zeal of one such philanthropist which drove the government to deal with some of the most obtrusive scandals connected with merchant shipping for some years mr plimsoll one of the members for derby had been trying to attract the attention of parliament and the public to the sacrifice of life caused by unseaworthy overloaded and over-insured ships a royal commission was appointed to inquire into the matter and on its report the government in eighteen seventy five decided to legislate the session of eighteen seventy five was however a crowded one and on july twenty second disraeli announced that he was regretfully compelled to drop the merchant shipping bill with a view to early legislation in the following year thereupon mr plimsoll moved as every one realized by generous but uncontrollable indignation provoked a violent scene in the house he declared that the action or inaction of the government would 
consign some thousands of living human beings to undeserved and miserable death and declared his intention to unmask the villains who send men to death and destruction refusing to withdraw mr plimsoll was reported to the house but its leader readily consented on the appeal of a sympathetic irish member to defer his motion of censure for a week at the close of that time mr plimsoll tendered an ample apology he could afford to do so the battle which he had fought so strenuously was won during the week's interval public opinion had manifested itself with unprecedented force in his favour the government wisely bowing before the storm introduced and passed as a temporary measure the unseaworthy ships act giving to the board of trade powers as to the detention of ships but throwing upon the ship owners the responsibility of fixing a load line for each separate voyage the merchant shipping act of eighteen seventy six incorporated enlarged and rendered permanent the provisions of the temporary act of eighteen seventy five plimsoll was anxious that the board of trade should fix the load line for each ship the government however was firm in adherence to the principle asserted in the temporary act and left the responsibility to the owners of set purpose a catalogue summary of legislation has been inflicted upon the reader even so the summary is not exhaustive but it may serve to indicate the general character of the work accomplished in the domestic sphere by disraeli's second administration few governments have earned a better record it is true that critics of a later day accustomed to bolder departures from the principle of laissez-faire are apt to deride the legislation of these days as halting and indecisive maimed by a too tender regard for vested interests and the rights of individuals and vitiated by reluctance to confer upon public authorities compulsory powers even if it be admitted that the later is the better way it does not follow that the former was not good in itself and at the time the best possible the legislative and administrative achievements of the first three years of the disraeli government generously fulfilled not the specific promises for these were notably absent but the general spirit of the programme laid before the electorate by the tory leader it is not however for its legislation that disraeli's regime is held in remembrance nor even for its finance the new chancellor of the exchequer was a cautious and unimaginative man he succeeded to a surplus of six million pounds and to a period of retrenchment and prosperity it was no fault of his that he had to provide for increased expenditure out of a contracting revenue his first budget eighteen seventy four called for no ingenuity he had merely to spend his predecessor's surplus he did it by taking one pence off the income tax thus reducing it to the lowest figure tuppence at which it ever stood he repealed the sugar duties and the tax on horses and he made a wise readjustment of the finance of the post office savings bank the most significant and the most questionable feature of the budget was a grant in relief of local taxation which cost the exchequer over one million pounds sterling he increased the contribution of the treasury from one-third to one-half of the expenses of the police force and he made a grant to the local authorities of four shillings per head for each pauper lunatic maintained in a lunatic asylum this grant was undoubtedly a step toward the better classification of paupers and the more humane and scientific treatment of the insane but it did not conduce to economy of northcote's second budget eighteen seventy five the only noticeable feature was the inception of the new sinking fund down to this time extinction of debt depended entirely upon the amount of unexpended balances in the hands of the spending departments these balances went automatically to the reduction of debt with this old sinking fund northcote did not interfere but he contrived in addition a new one of his own he proposed to raise the debt charged by gradual stages from twenty seven million two hundred and fifteen thousand pounds the sum at which it stood in eighteen seventy five to twenty eight million pounds applying the balance remaining after the payment of interest to the gradual extinction of the capital charge 
the device was open to some but not all of the objections urged against the whole principle of the sinking funds so dear to the minds of eighteenth-century financiers but it held out a realizable hope of the gradual extinction of a real burden and it was in the best sense conservative finance if northcote had had the courage to apply to the same purpose the whole of the death duties and it is the only purpose to which such duties can legitimately and scientifically be applied he would have set an even better example but his sinking fund policy so far as it went was sound after eighteen seventy five he had no more chances in eighteen seventy six he had to face an expenditure of over seventy eight million pounds an increase of five million five hundred thousand pounds over eighteen seventy four and the ordinary sources of revenue were beginning to show an ominous lack of elasticity the anticipated deficit was met by a reimposition of the one pence on the income tax but the increased rate was accompanied by a readjustment of the incidents the limit of total exemption was raised with questionable prudence from one hundred pounds to one hundred and fifty pounds while the graduation principle was extended hitherto eighty pounds deduction had been allowed on incomes under three hundred pounds northcote allowed one hundred and twenty pounds on incomes under four hundred pounds we have a budget ready made to our hands reduces to a sentence the financial statement of eighteen seventy seven there was neither remission nor imposition of taxation the budget of eighteen seventy eight involves a criticism not of finance but of foreign policy to the chancellor of the exchequer it was a necessarily unpleasant statement expenditure as compared with eighteen seventy four was up by nearly nine million pounds for this increase the civil service had to bear the heaviest responsibility three million five hundred thousand pounds but armaments cost two million pounds more the income tax was raised to five pence tobacco had to pay an additional four pence per pound and dog licenses were with certain exceptions raised from five shillings to seven shillings sixpence this was bad enough but worse was to come august brought supplementary estimates of over three million pounds and the situation which northcote had to face in the spring of eighteen seventy nine was gloomy not to say grave on his own shoulders there was now a heavy burden he was not only the watchdog of the treasury but for more than two years had been leading the house of commons but he faced all his duties with quiet courage extraordinary expenditure in the near and far east was met for the most part despite gladstone's protest by short loans the expenses of the zulu war northcote expected to defray without recourse to increased taxation the country was in no mood and in no condition to assume additional burdens the portents were unmistakable trade was depressed and falling prices were bringing ruin upon agriculturalists northcote's reign at the treasury was nearly over the budget of eighteen eighty was introduced amid the turmoil of an impending dissolution commercial depression a declining revenue and war expenditure in south africa combined to produce a large deficit but there was to be no new taxation equilibrium was restored by a raid on the new sinking fund the favorite child of northcote's finance in that finance the opposition had a legitimate object of criticism and they did not neglect it but there was a general disposition not to impute over much blame to the unfortunate chancellor of the exchequer sir stafford northcote had almost too obviously the aspect of a good man struggling with adversity and mr gladstone generally treated him with a tenderness which was not extended to his chief for finance after all depends upon policy and if ever the policy of a government was the policy of its chief it was so in the case of lord beaconsfield's administration to one aspect of that policy attention had been already drawn sanitas sanitatum omnia sanitas that pledge was amply redeemed we must now turn to imperium it is impossible to deny that with the author of sibyl social reform was a matter of long-standing conviction and genuine enthusiasm the lesson which disraeli taught his party was the possibility which he had long perceived of an alliance between the tories and the english wage earners and the true basis of this alliance was their common descent from individualistic liberalism.
the words are those of a critic not entirely friendly to disraeli but there is truth in them yet it is not the whole truth it was another lesson enforced by lord beaconsfield footnote disraeli acting on urgent medical advice accepted a peerage and took the title of earl of beaconsfield august eighteenth eighteen seventy six and footnote with which his name will be immemorially associated you have a new world new influences at work new and unknown objects and dangers with which to cope the relations of england to europe are not the same as they were in the days of lord chatham or frederick the great the queen of england has become the sovereign of the most powerful of oriental states on the other side of the globe there are now establishments belonging to her teeming with wealth and population there are vast and novel elements in the distribution of power what our duty is at this critical moment is to maintain the empire of england the passages here quoted are taken from three separate speeches but they present in a concise form the ideas and principles which actuated lord beaconsfield as minister of the crown he possessed an unusual degree the gift denied to most english statesmen the gift of imagination his ideas and utterances were even on the confession of opponents spacious he perceived that a vast change was taking place under the eyes of his contemporaries but unperceived by most of them in the centre of political gravity a new world new influences at work this new world lord beaconsfield hoped might be predominantly english the new influences he tried to shape in the interests of the british empire the first indication given to the world of the new imperialism was the purchase of the khedive's shares in the suez canal on november twenty fifth eighteen seventy five the world was startled by the news that the british government had purchased from the khedive for the sum of four million pounds sterling his one hundred and seventy six thousand shares in the suez canal the merit of the achievement was disraeli's alone and for him it was facilitated by his friendship with the city and particularly with the great house of rothschild if disraeli had not stepped in the shares would have gone to france who would then have held the whole share capital the rothschilds received two and a half per cent as brokerage commission and five per cent interest on the money they advanced for the purchase until the government could take up the shares some of disraeli's less imaginative colleagues notably his chancellor of the exchequer did not like the transaction as a financial speculation its success has long since been brilliantly demonstrated the shares are now worth thirty million pounds sterling and yield a revenue of nearly one million pounds or about twenty five per cent on the purchase money as a political move it marks a new departure of the highest significance england had been curiously blind to her interests in the eastern mediterranean though they were clearly perceived by her enemies really to destroy england we must make ourselves masters of egypt thus napoleon had written in seventeen ninety seven and in seventeen ninety eight he tried to do it the czar nicholas i of russia had opened the question to english statesmen in eighteen forty four and had pressed egypt upon us in eighteen fifty three to no purpose our blindness did not permit us to perceive or perhaps our morality forbade us to consent to disraeli the purchase of the canal shares was no isolated speculation but a move in a coherent and preconcerted plan his next stroke had a twofold object during the winter of eighteen seventy five eighteen seventy six the heir apparent had undertaken an extended tour in india the visit which was without precedent in the history of the empire proved an eminent success on january first eighteen seventy six the prince of wales held a chapter of the star of india in calcutta on february eighth the queen's speech at the opening of parliament read in the queen's presence announced the intention of the government to ask for a formal addition to the style and titles of the sovereign before his last session in the house of commons closed disraeli had the satisfaction of making his sovereign empress of india the new style was bitterly opposed in parliament and evoked much dissatisfaction in the country 
Time, however, has amply vindicated the wisdom and prescience of the minister. His coup was not due to the brilliant inspiration of the moment. It was the expression of a policy long since predetermined. You ought at once to tell the people of India that the relation between them and their real ruler and sovereign, Queen Victoria, shall be drawn nearer. You must act upon the opinion of India on that subject immediately, and you can only act upon the opinion of Eastern nations through their imagination. So Disraeli had spoken at the time of the mutiny and in opposition. Thus he spoke in 1876 as First Minister of the Crown. The princes and nations of India know in India what this bill means, and they know that what it means is what they wish. Meanwhile, an important change had taken place in the personnel of the government of India. For some months past there had been friction between the Secretary of State and the Viceroy. Lord Salisbury not only disapproved of Lord Northbrook's fiscal policy, but raised an important question as to the constitutional relations which should subsist between the Viceroy and the Secretary of State. In a dispatch dated November 11, 1875, Lord Salisbury administered a severe rebuke to the Viceroy, and the latter immediately resigned. End of Section 45